Call of the Wild by Jack London Chapter 4 Who has won to mastership? Eh, hey, what I say, I speak true when I say that buck two devils. This was Francois's speech next morning when he discovered Spitz missing and Buck covered with wounds. He drew him to the fire and by its light pointed them out. Oh, that Spitz fight like hell, said Perrault as he surveyed the gaping rips and cuts. And that Buck fight like two hells, said Francois's answer. And now we make good time. No more Spitz, no more trouble, sure. While Perrault back packed the camp outfit and loaded the sled, the dog driver proceeded to harness the dogs. Buck trotted up to the place Spitz would have occupied as leader, but Francois, not noticing him, brought Solex to the co coveted position. In his judgment, Solex was the best lead dog left. Buck sprang upon Solex in a fury, driving him back and standing in his place. Hey, hey, Francois cried, slapping his thighs gleefully. Look at that Buck. Him kill that Spitz, him tink to take the job. Go away, chew, he cried, but Buck refused to budge. He took Buck by the scruff of the neck and, though the dog growled threateningly, dragged him to one side and replaced Solex. The old dog did not like it and showed plainly he was afraid of Buck. Francois was obdurate, but he turned his back, Buck again displaced Solex, who was not at all unwilling to go. Francois was angry. Oh, well, now by gar I fix you, he cried, coming back with a heavy club in his hand. Buck remembered the man in the red sweater and retreated slowly. Nor did he attempt to charge in when Solex was once more brought forward, but he circled just beyond the range of the club, snarling with bitterness and rage. And while he circled, he watched the club so as to dodge it if thrown by Francois, for he was becoming wise in the way of clubs. The driver went about his work, and he called to Buck when he was ready to put him in his old place in front of Dave. Buck retreated two or three steps. Francois followed him up, whereupon he again retreated. After some time of this, Francois threw down the club, thinking that Buck feared a thrashing, but Buck was in open revolt. He wanted, not to escape a clubbing, but to have the leadership. It was his by right. He had earned it, and he would not be content with less. Perrault took a hand. Between them, they ran him for about the better part of an hour. They threw clubs at him. He dodged. They cursed him and his fathers and mothers before him, and all his seed to come after him down to the remotest generation, and every hair on his body and drop of blood in his veins. And he answered curse with snarl and kept out of their reach. But he did not try to run away, but retreated around and around the camp, advertising plainly that when his desire was met, he would come in and be good. Francois sat down and scratched his head. Perrault looked at his watch and swore. Time was flying, and they should have been on the trail an hour gone. Francois scratched his head again. He shook it and grinned sheepishly at the courier, who shrugged his shoulders in sign that they were beaten. Then Francois went up to where Solix stood and called to Buck. Buck laughed, as dogs laugh, yet kept his distance. Francois unfastened Solix's traces and put him back in his old place. The team stood harnessed to the sled in an unbroken line ready for the trail. There was no place for Buck, save at the front. Once more Francois called, and once more Buck laughed and kept away. Throw down the club, Perrault commanded. Francois complied, whereupon Buck trotted in laughing triumphantly and swung round into position at the head of the team. His traces were fastened, the sled broken out, and with both men running they dashed out onto the river trail. Highly as the dog driver had forevalued Buck with his two devils, he found while the day was yet young that he had undervalued him. At a bound, Buck took up the duties of leadership and where judgment was required and quick thinking and quick acting, he showed himself the superior even of Spitz, of whom Francois had never seen an equal. But it was in giving the law and making his mates live up to it that Buck excelled. Dave and Solix did not mind the change in leadership. It was none of their business. Their business was to toil and to toil mightily in the traces. So long as that was not interfered with, they didn't care what happened. Billy the good-natured could lead for all they cared so long as he kept order. The rest of the team, however, had grown unruly during the last days of Spitz, and their surprise was great now that Buck had proceeded to lick them into shape. Pike, who pulled at Buck's heels and who never at once put an ounce more of his weight against Breastband than he was compelled to do, was swiftly and repeatedly shaking for loafing, and ere the first day was done, he was pulling more than ever before in his life. The first night in camp, Joe, the sour one, was punished roundly, a thing that Spitz had never succeeded in doing. Buck simply smothered him by virtue of superior weight, and cut him up until he ceased snapping and began to whine for mercy.
the general tone of the team picked up immediately. It recovered its old-time solidarity, and once more the dogs leaped as one dog in the traces. At the rink rapids, two native huskies, Teak and Kuna, were added, and the celerity with which Buck broke them in took away Francoise's breath. Never such a dog as that Buck, he cried. No, never. Him worth one thousand dollar by gar. Eh, what do you say, Perrault? And Perrault nodded. He was ahead of the record then and gaining day by day. The trail was in excellent condition, well packed and hard, and there's no new fallen snow with which to contend. It was not too cold. The temperature dropped to fifty below zero and remained there the whole trip. The men rode and ran by turn, and the dogs were kept on the jump, but with infrequent stoppages. The thirty-mile river was comparatively coated with ice, and they covered in one day going out what had taken them ten days coming in. In one run, they made a sixty-mile dash from the foot of Lake Labarge to the White Horse Rapids. Across Marsh, Tagish, and Bennett, seventy miles of lakes, they flew so fast that the man whose turn it was to run towed behind the sled at the end of a rope. And on the last night of the second week, they topped White Pass and dropped down the sea slope with the lights of Skagway and the shipping at their feet. It was a record run, and each day for fourteen days they had averaged forty miles. For three days, Perrault and Francois threw chests up and down the main street of Skagway and were deluged with invitations to drink, while the team was the constant center of a worshipful crowd of dogbusters and mushers. Then three or four western badmen aspired to clean out the town and were riddled like pepper boxes for their pains, and public interest turned to other idols. Next came official orders. Francois called Buck to him, threw his arms around him, and wept over him. And that was the last of Francois and Perrault. Like other men, they passed out of Buck's life for good. A Scotch half-breed took charge of him and his mates, and in company with a dozen other dog teams, he started back over the weary trail to Dawson. It was no light running now, nor record time, but heavy toil each day with a heavy load behind, for this was the mail train, carrying word from the world to men who sought gold under the shadow of the pole. Buck did not like it, but he bore up well to the work, taking pride in it as the manner of Dave and Solix, and seeing that his mates, whether they prided in it or not, did their fair share. It was a monotonous life, operating with machine-like regularity. One day was very like another. At a certain time each morning, the cooks turned out, fires were built, and breakfast was eaten. Then, while some broke camp, others harnessed the dogs, and they were under way an hour or so before the darkness fell, which gave warning of dawn. At night, camp was made. Some pitched the fires, and others cut firewood and pine boughs for the beds, and still others carried water or ice for the cooks. Also, the dogs were fed. To them, this was the one feature of the day, though it was good to loaf around after the fish was eaten for an hour or so with the other dogs, of which there were five score and odd. There were fierce fighters among them, but three battles with the fiercest brought Buck to mastery, so that when he bristled and showed his teeth, they got out of his way. Best of all, perhaps, he loved to lie near the fire, hind legs crouched under him, four legs stretched out in front, head raised and eyes blinking dreamily at the flames. Sometimes he thought of Judge Miller's big house in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley, and of the cement swimming tank, and Isabel, the Mexican hairless, and Toots, the Japanese pug. But oftener he remembered the man in the red sweater, the death of Curly, the great fight with Spitz, and the good things he'd eaten or would like to eat. He was not homesick. The sunland was very dim and distant, and such memories had no power over him. Far more potent were the memories of his heredity that gave things he'd never seen before a seeming familiarity. The instincts, which were but the memories of his ancestors become habits, which had lapsed in later days, and still later in him, quickened and became alive again. Sometimes, as he crouched there, blinking dreamily at the flames, it seemed that the flames were of another fire, and that as he crouched by this other fire, he saw another and different man from the half-breed cook before him. This other man was shorter of leg and longer of arm, with muscles that were stringy and knotty, rather than rounded and swelling. The hair of this man was long and matted, and his head slanted back under it from his eyes. He uttered strange sounds, and it seemed very much afraid of the darkness, into which he peered continually, clutching in his hand which hung midway between knee and foot, a stick with a heavy stone made fast to the end. He was all but naked, a ragged and fire-scorched skin hanging part way down his back, but on his body there was much hair. In some places across the chest and shoulders, and down and outside of the arms and thighs, it was matted into almost a thick fur. He did not stand erect, but with trunk inclined from forward from the hips, 
on legs bent at the knees. About his body was a peculiar springiness, or resiliency, almost cat-like and a quick alertness, as if one who lived in a perpetual fear of things seen and unseen. At other times, this hairy man squatted by the fire with head between his legs and slept. On such occasions, his elbows were on his knees, his hands clasped above his head as though to shed rain by the hairy arms. And beyond that fire, in the circling darkness, Buck could see many gleaming coals, two by two, always two by two, which he knew to be the eyes of the great beasts of prey. And he could hear the crashing of their bodies through the undergrowth, and the noises they made in the night. And dreaming there by the Yukon bank with lazy eyes blinking at the fire, these sounds and sights of another world would make the hair to rise along his back and stand on end across his shoulders and up his neck, till he whimpered low and suppressedly, or growled softly, and the half-breed cook shouted at him, Hey, you buck, wake up! Upon the other world would vanish, and the real world would come into his eyes, and he would get up and yawn and stretch as though he had been asleep. It was a hard trip with the mail behind him, and the heavy work wore them down. They were short of weight and in poor condition when they made Dawson, and should have had a ten days or a week's rest at least. But in two days' time, they dropped down the Yukon bank from the barracks, loaded with letters for the outside. The dogs were tired, the drivers grumbling, and to make matters worse, it snowed every day. This meant a soft trail, greater friction on the runners and heavier pulling for the dogs. Yet the drivers were fair through it all and did their best for the animals. Each night, the dogs were attended to first. They ate before the drivers ate, and no man sought his sleeping robe till he'd seen to the feet of the dogs he drove. Still, their strength went down. Since the beginning of the winter, they'd traveled 1,800 miles, dragging sleds the whole weary distance, and 1,800 miles will tell upon the life of the toughest. Buck stood it, keeping his mates up to their work and maintaining discipline, though he too was very tired. Billy cried and whimpered regularly in his sleep each night. Joe was sourer than ever, and Solix was unapproachable, blind side or other side. But it was Dave who suffered most of all. Something had gone wrong with him. He became more morose and irritable, and when camp was pitched and at once made his nest where his driver fed him. Once out of the harness and down, he did not get on his feet again till harness up time in the morning. Sometimes in the traces, when jerked by a sudden stoppage of the sled, or straining to start it, he would cry out with pain. The driver examined him but could find nothing. All the drivers became interested in his case. They talked it over at mealtime and over their last pipes before going to bed. And one night, they held a consultation. He was brought from his nest to the fire and was pressed and prodded until he cried out many times. Something was wrong inside, but they could locate no broken bones. They could not make it out. By the time Kasserbar was reached, he was so weak that he was falling repeatedly in the traces. The Scotch half-breed called a halt and took him out of the team, making the next dog Solix fast to the sled. His intention was to rest Dave, letting him run free behind the sled. Sick as he was, Dave resented being taken out, grunting and growling while the traces were unfastened and whimpering brokenheartedly when he saw Solix in the position he'd held and served for so long. For the pride of trace and trail was his, and sick unto death, he could not bear that another dog should do his work. When the sled started, he floundered in the soft snow alongside the beaten trail, attacking Solix with his teeth, rushing against him and trying to thrust him off into the soft snow on the other side, striving to leap inside his traces and get between him and the sled, and all the while whining and yelping and crying with grief and pain. The half-breed tried to drive him away with the whip, but he paid no heed to the stinging lash, and the man had not the heart to strike harder. Dave refused to run quietly on the trail behind the sled where the going was easy, but continued to flounder alongside in the soft snow, where the going was the most difficult until he was exhausted. And then he fell, and lay where he fell, howling lugubriously in the long train of sleds as they turned by. With the last remnant of his strength, he managed to stagger along behind till the train made another stop, and when he floundered past the sleds to his own, where he stood alongside Solix. His driver lingered a moment to get a light for his pipe from the man behind. Then he returned and started his dogs. They swung out onto the trail with remarkable lack of exertion, turned their heads uneasily, and stopped in surprise. The driver was surprised, too. The sled had not moved. He called his comrades to witness the sight. Dave had bitten through both of Solix's traces and was standing directly in front of the sled in his proper place. He pleaded with his eyes to remain there. The driver was perplexed. His comrades talked of how a dog could break its heart through the through being denied the work that killed it, 
and recalled instances they'd known where dogs too old for the toil or injured had died because they were cut out of the traces. Also, they held it a mercy, since Dave was to die anyway, that he should die in the traces, heart easy and content. So he was harnessed in again, and proudly he pulled as of old, though more than once he cried out involuntarily from the bite of his inward hurt. Several times he fell down and was dragged in the traces, and once the sled ran upon him so he limped thereafter in one of his hind legs. But he held out till camp was reached, when his driver made a place for him by the fire. Morning found him too weak to travel. At harness-up time he tried to crawl to his driver. By convulsive efforts he got on his feet, staggered, and fell. Then he wormed his way forward slowly towards where the harnesses were being put on his mates. He would advance his forelegs and drag up his body with a sort of hitching movement. Then he would advance his forelegs and hitch again, uh, ahead again for a few more inches. His strength left him, and the last his mates saw of him, he lay gasping in the snow and yearning toward them. But they could hear him mournfully howling till they passed out of sight behind a belt of river timber. Here the train was halted. The Scotch half-breed slowly retraced his steps to the camp they had left. The men ceased talking. A revolver shot rang out. The man came back hurriedly. The whips snapped, the bells tinkled merrily, and the sleds turned along the trail. But Buck knew, every dog knew, what had taken place behind the belt of river trees.